Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give Dr. Oliver another round of applause. And I'm going to ask all of those of you who are seated in the rear to come down front, please. Everybody in the rear, we're going to be down front so that those who are on their way can access the seats in the rear without disturbing the program. And while you're coming, may I remind you that we have two more Crown Forums for this academic year or for this fall semester. If you have not attended six Crown Forums already, you will need to be at the next two Crown Forums. We offer eight Crown Forums in the academic semester. You must attend six, at least six, of those Crown Forums. Uh, gentlemen, let's move very quickly. I need you down front. Thank you, Mr. Morehouse. Please come down front. We're going to be scanning from the, rear, from the front this today. I want to also remind you that we have only, more, only four more weeks in the fall semester. So I know that men of Morehouse, you are hitting the ground running so that you will have a big finish, a successful semester, another successful semester at Morehouse College. Please continue to come down front. Please continue to come down front. Thank you, men of Morehouse. All men of Morehouse, I need you down front especially those in the rear, please come down front. Thank you. To President Franklin and other members of the DS, men of Morehouse, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our Humanities Crown Forum. It is also my pleasure to welcome members of our viewing audience who are looking at us and watching our proceedings this morning live on the web. We will now have prayer by Mr. Devon Jerome Crawford, chapel assistant, the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel, and a member of the class of 2014. Mr. Crawford. Let us prepare ourselves for a moment of prayer. God, you are the source of our strength and sustainer of all life. We are thankful for the many blessings we have experienced, which are evident in our being at Morehouse College, the friendships, relationships, and brotherly ties we are developing, and the families that continue to support us in both the joyful and troubling times. God, we are indeed thankful. As we gather in this international chapel, we promote a vision to establish a beloved world community which values the uncompromised diversity and sacred nature of all persons. Do not allow us to become isolated from or indifferent to our brothers and sisters, but rather affirm inclusive lifestyles and worldviews. For we know that there can be no true union with your spirit if we have no peace or love for your people. Now, God, continue to empower us to be the hope of our communities and nation in reducing unnecessary violence, curing debilitating diseases, and becoming responsible stewards of our bodies and environment. Empower us, God, now and in the days to come. With your nature, we do pray. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Absent this morning is someone very dear to us, Dr. Clarissa Myrick Harris, who recently took office at Morehouse College as Dean of the Division of Humanities and Social Sciences. And this is the social, uh, the, excuse me, the Humanities Crown Forum, and I know she would have been here, but unfortunately, as many of you know, her husband, Dr. Norman Harris, was funeralized last Friday and her brother, Mr. Jason Harris, was funeralized only a few weeks earlier. So in her absence this morning, 
Let's continue to lift her up in our prayers. Let us continue to lift up her family and our thoughts as they navigate a very difficult terrain of loss and recovery during the weeks to come. Thank you. We have celebrated the sciences and business in our liberal arts curriculum during previous Crown Forums, and today our focus is on the humanities. It is not unusual for students to ask, why do I have to take so many general studies, uh, general education courses? Why can't I just take those courses in my major field and graduate? The answer is easy, because at Morehouse College, you receive a liberal arts education, which means that we do more here than prepare you for a job in a particular field. Instead, you receive an education that prepares you to compete in the marketplace of ideas that involve a variety of disciplines. A liberal arts education encourages you to think independently and to make sound judgments. A liberal arts education allows you to discover new perspectives as you expand your own horizons and as you form your own opinions and your judgments. And this is so important in our society today. The sense here is that you subsequently become better prepared to meet the challenges of life. Each Crown Forum is designed in some way to expose you to great ideas to expose you to some of the best that has been thought and said in the world. And our Crown Forum this morning is no different. By its very content, the theme of our Crown Forums encourages a quest for knowledge that puts your major field in a broader context. I don't know if you know, but employers are beginning to realize that a liberal education prepares students for real life challenges in a way that vocational schools often cannot and do not. And in today's economy, employers are looking for potential employees with transferable skills, skills that employees can take with them to any job, anywhere, such as those indispensable skills of written and verbal communication, the ability to solve complex problems, the ability to work with others, and the ability to adapt in a changing world. These are the hallmarks of a liberal arts education. It is altogether fitting then that in today's Crown Forum, we celebrate the humanities and the value of the humanities in a liberal arts education. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the occasion. We will now have a solo, Plenty Good Room, performed by Mr. Antoine Griggs, baritone, member of the Morehouse College Glee Club and the class of 2013. And Ms. we welcome back Mr. Brandon Waddles, member of the class of 2011, who will accompany him, and he is also the arranger of this selection. After this, the program will proceed as printed. Thank you. Plenty good room, plenty good room, good room in my father's kingdom. Plenty good room, plenty good room, you just choose your seat and sit down. Plenty good room, plenty good room, good room in my father's kingdom. Plenty good room. Plenty good room, you just choose your seat and sit down. I would not be a backslider, I'll tell you the reason why. Cause if my Lord should call on me, well, I wouldn't be ready to die. Oh, plenty good room, plenty good room. Good room in my father's kingdom, plenty good room, plenty good room, you just choose your seat and sit down. 
I would not be a liar. I'll tell you the reason why. Cause if my Lord should call on me, well, I wouldn't be ready to die. Oh, plenty good room, oh Lord, eh? good room in my Father's kingdom. Plenty good room, oh Lord, eh? choose your seat and sit down. Plenty good room. Oh, Lord, he plenty good room in my Father's kingdom. Plenty good room. Oh, Lord, he just chose a seat and sit down. Thank you, Brother Griggs, Brother Crawford, Dr. Oliver, Dr. Ann Watts, and all those who participate today on this last Crown Forum before an historic presidential election next Tuesday, November 6. It's often my pleasure to stand here and introduce Crown Forum speakers to the Morehouse community, but today I have the special opportunity to bring to you a friend, a colleague, a scholar, a public intellectual, and one who stands tall in this nation as a voice of truth and hope and justice. Dr. Julianne Malvo is an economist, an author, an educator, and a television personality and is recognized among her peers for her insightful and progressive observations. They have paved the way to many a fruit, fruitful career in the lives of her students and those who have followed her writings. She graduated high school early and completed both a bachelor's and a master's degree in economics at Boston College in three years. Since earning a doctorate in economics from MIT, Dr. Malvo has worked in academia as a professor, a visiting scholar, and as a public intellectual sharing her knowledge with students at some of the nation's most prestigious colleges and universities. She is noted for her ability to shape public opinion on race, culture, economics, and gender, and many other topics, and has done so in quite a number of national publications. It's often the case when I'm traveling on the road for Morehouse, I will open a USA Today as I step onto the elevator and route to an appointment. The first thing I go to is the editorial page where I often find Dr. Malvo's insightful comments. You'll see in her bio printed in the program other publications for which she writes. In 2007, Dr. Malvo became the 15th president of Bennett College for women in Greensboro, North Carolina. Under her leadership, Bennett's accreditation with, the S with SACS, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, was reaffirmed, and the college began to undergo significant facilities improvements, the first major construction to the campus in more than a quarter century. I can attest to this as it was my great pleasure to speak to the women of Bennett just three weeks ago. And uh, Dr. Malvo and I have looked forward to this exchange of podia, as it were, in affirming the historic connection of our institutions between our former presidents of Morehouse and Bennett. So there is that historic connection by virtue of the friendship of Dr. David Jones of Bennett and Dr. Uh, Benjamin Elijah Mays of Morehouse. It is an extraordinary and a lovely campus. If you men have not visited Bennett, I hope you will do so. It uh, is extraordinary and impressive, thanks to the leadership of Dr. Malvo. She's now focused her attention full time on serving as a public intellectual, as one who speaks truth to power the way all prophets do. And so, Men of Morehouse, I ask that you welcome our friend, our colleague, 
on this historic Crown Forum in advance of a historic election. Welcome Dr. Julianne Malbo. Well, good morning, men of Morehouse. Morning. It's just my pleasure and my delight to be here, and I want to thank my dear friend, uh, Dr. Robert Franklin, for the invitation. I also want to say how humbled I am to be at Morehouse College. You know what they say about y'all. You can tell a man of, Mor man of Morehouse, but you can't tell them much. When I look at your lineage, your phenomenal lineage of brothers and sisters, well, brothers primarily, who have done the work here, what I'd like to say about them in the context of the humanities is all of them are Renaissance men. You look at a Calvin Butts or Mordecai Johnson, a Walter Leonard, Ambassador Nabret, a Samuel Jackson, our favorite actor, who is also very erudite, a David Satcher, a Maynard Jackson, a Lerone Bennett, a Howard Thurman. When you look at those gentlemen, what do you find? There are a number of things that you learn is that a Morehouse man is a man of integrity, of excellence, of achievement, committed to social and economic justice, and also a man of appearance. And I say that because when you walk up, I run into Morehouse brothers all the time. I love it when some of you have come to Ebony Soul at Bennett and distinguishing yourselves with your good looks, with your appropriate dress, with your friendly smiles, and with the confidence to walk up to folks and say, hi, my name is. Everybody doesn't do that. Some folks mumble, some folks walk like this, some folks, a young student said to me once, I was intimidated by you. I said, that was in your head, not mine. You cannot intimidate anybody unless to give, they give you, you give yourself permission to be intimidated. But in any case, as I look at the attributes that these men have in common, and I'm sure that many of you do, I thought about the fact that whether a Morehouse man is as predominant prominent, forgive me, as a David Satcher or Calvin Butts, whether visible or invisible, those notions of integrity, excellence, achievement, social and economic justice, and appearance are important. When we talk about Morehouse men being the future of our generation, and women at Bennett and Spelman being the future of our generation, those of us like Dr. Franklin and I, people of a certain age, not ancient, but of a certain age, look forward to the possibility of passing the baton. In the same ways that batons were passed from Dr. Benjamin Mays, who mentored Dr. Martin Luther King, to Dr. Martin Luther King, who was one of the most prophetic voices, not only of our race, but of our nation. Dr. Martin Luther King's commitment to social and economic justice, of course, was profound. And I won't preach to you about your own alum, but what I would say to you is that in his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, he said, I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, peace and freedom for their spirits. That is an economic program. And people often ask how as an economist I transcend fields. Because I tell people everybody, if they talk about distribution, is an economist. When an editor decides how many pages are going to be in a magazine, she may have be a lit major, but she's an economist. She makes a decision that this piece will stand and that piece will hold. And believe me, as a writer, I've been through some of those painful decisions many times. Your piece didn't make it this month, maybe next month. Or we're going to send you a kill fee. That really hurts your heart. That means they're not going to print your story, but they're going to give you a quarter of the money they said they were going to give you. But in any case, all of us at some level are economists, and I encourage all of you to embrace the economists in you. Social and economic justice, Dr. King. He, here's why I think he was an economist, and one of the things he said. He said, um, there are 40 million poor people in America, and how do you have a country that has 40 million poor people? He then said, you see, you have to ask this question. Who owns the iron? Who owns the oil? You know, who owns the water? And he goes on to say, if the world is two-thirds water, why do we pay water bills? Now, do not try that with the water company, because they're not going to get it. But the, the issue is he's talking about issues of distribution. 
And those are issues that we still talk about. The 99, the, the Occupy movement with the 99% is really asking the question, why should the 1% have all the dollars? When Mr. Romney says that 47 million people are dependent, he's really raising a question about distribution as well as ignorance. I know that this is a crown form, but y'all will forgive me, it's a political season, Dr. Franklin, and you know me when it comes to politics. So you know there is a direct line, if you think of it, I don't know if it's a direct line or a dotted line between Dr. King and President Obama. But I'll tell you what I thought yesterday in Halloween when they said trick or treat, I said, well, Romney would be the trick and Obama would be the treat. And that's kind of one of the things we have to think about in this election. Our president clearly deserves re-election. He, um, the first action that he had as a feminist, I, had, I really applauded. He signed the Lilly Ledbetter Act. Now, the Lilly Ledbetter Act was an act that said you could sue for unequal pay. Well, you could already do that, but you have 180 days to sue. Now, if you don't know that you've been paid unequally, 180 days is insufficient. Mrs. Ledbetter found out that she had been unequally paid for some 30 years. But when she went to sue, they said the statute of limitations has run out. So President Obama changed that rule and has focused on women's issues throughout his presidency. Many will talk about the handling of the recession, but the fact is that no one could have done better. When he came into office, our labor market was literally hemorrhaging 800,000 jobs a month. Think about 800,000 jobs a month. He now has managed in the past two years to increase employment levels by 100 to 150,000 jobs per month. Now, is that enough? Oh, no. Not when the overall unemployment rate is 7.8%, when the black unemployment rate officially is 13%. I have this thing I call the Malvo indicator. Of course, I would have to name it after me. Uh, the Malvo indicator of unemployment and basically what they do is they take a factor of about 1.7 to say, what's the real unemployment rate? Well, for everyone, the real unemployment rate is roughly 12%, not 7.8, but the real unemployment rate for our community is over 20%. Before the most recent report that came out, it was 25%. So that means one in four African Americans did not have a job. Let's just expand that a little bit. We looked at African American men the MPOP, which is the employment population ratio. And I know there's some econ folks in the house and some economists, labor economists in the house. But the employment population ratio represents a percent of people 16 to 65 who are working, whether literally employed or not, because a lot of people drop out of the labor market. The MPOP for white men is nearly 70%. The MPOP for African American men ranges around 57%. That's the difference. In some of our major cities, the unemployment rate or the MPOP for African American men is as high as, well, as low as 50%, which means that there are one in two African American men in New York City, one in two African American men in Cleveland. These are some of the cities. One in two African American men in Boston do not have jobs. Now, what if, just let's play with this for a minute. What if one in two of the majority people did not have jobs? What if one in two Caucasian men did not have jobs? Then the American Jobs Act that has been languishing in the floor of Congress for over a year would have been passed. But you see, your average member of Congress has wealth of $750,000, excluding the value of their home. Most people, much of their wealth is held in the value of their home. So how can somebody with a median income of $750,000 empathize with someone who does not have a job. These Republicans have blocked President Obama at every direction, and he should not be penalized for their intransience. The fact is these people have sat on. They've sat on a number of employment possibilities. John Boehner said his number one priority was to get rid of President Obama. He said this in January of 2009. He said his number one priority was to make him a first-term president. Now, with unemployment rate in double digits, shouldn't your number one priority be to generate some jobs? 
Might not your, unemployed, your number one priority be to catch up with these thieves on Wall Street? No, your one, number one priority is to get rid of a president who you haven't even given a chance to. You young people also have to know that President Obama, in his four years, has raised the value of the Pell Grant, which many of you experience, has increased HBCU funding. And so we have, as students, as young people, as people who are committed to education, we have to support this president. Even more, understand that the Ryan Romney budget will cut the budget by at least 10 percent. The sequestration, which will happen anyway unless there's a deal, will cut the budget between 7 and 9 percent. Understand that that cut will be unequally borne by the HBCU community. And so understand that when you go to the polls and vote for President Obama, what you're really doing is speaking for yourself. Now, has this president been imperfect? Absolutely. But he, he's not hit it out of the park because no one has let him. But he has kicked the can towards social and economic justice. So there's either a straight line or, or dotted line between he and Dr. King. And we have to acknowledge that. The other question I would ask, although we're not picking the better of two evils, we're picking a superior over an inferior. But we might ask, could Willard do it better? And I have taken to calling him Willard. Remember, you all are probably too young, but you've seen reruns. Gary Coleman used to go into this program. He said, what you talking about, Willard? Oh, no, he said Willis, but I think it's the same thing. What you talking about? Every time I see Brother Romney on television, I pray for him every day. I pray for him to get good sense. I, want to, I say, you know, what you talking about, Willard? What are you talking about with the 47% and with any number of other things? And so, you know, I, don't, I know I don't need to tell the men of Morehouse how important it is to vote, but I just came by for a minute to say a few things, and that was one of them. Now, I'm working on an essay that I want to share with you all, just some of the highlights of it. It's called The Role of the Black Man in the 21st Century. What I think that black men will understand, and I'm sure you do, is that the realities for men have changed. In one-third of all families, and probably nearly half of African-American families, women are out earning the men that they're connected with. Women are out enrolling men in colleges. In our, among our community, two-thirds women, one-third men. In the majority community, 55% of the enrollment is female, 45% of the enrollment is male. Some people have even talked about affirmative action for men, and indeed, Wake Forest College in the Winston-Salem area has implemented a program for affirmative action for men. Why would anybody do this kind of thing? Because social formation issues and family formation issues are important. As a feminist, I've been often told that as a feminist, you must not like men. Now, it isn't that I don't like men, but I like women to be treated equally. But our community is not a bifurcation community. It's not about the men or the women. It's about both of us working together. And it's so very important for us to understand that. Brother Minister Farrakhan and I have developed a very positive relationship over the years. But when the Million Man March happened in 1995, he said the women should stay home and teach and pray while the men move forward and uh, march and lead. Hmm? Well, I wrote him and said, Brother Farrakhan, how can you expect to win a war when you disable half of the soldiers? Because women would be half of the soldiers. Now, when we did the Millions More Movement in 2005, I was one of the co-MCs of the program, and we deliberately said that there would be at least one-third women on the program. Brother Farrakhan had evolved, and I was grateful for that. Now, we have to look at both of us together, but what does these new realities mean for African-American men? Men can no longer define themselves simply by their earnings. Men can define themselves by a number of other things, including excellence. Men, do not need, to, men need to transform and transcend the notion of patriarchy. We are a patriarchal community. I went to a church one day, Brother Rev, and they were giving brothers certificates for staying married for five years. I'm saying, now that's what you're supposed to do, not five, but 15, 20, 25. You're getting a certificate for doing what you're supposed to do? But we minimize our brothers when we decide. They didn't give it to the sisters, and they didn't know what they were going through in order to be able to be married to those men for five years. But they didn't get the sisters a certificate. They gave it to the brothers. Implicitly, that suggests a whole lot of things that I'm not going to get into. But patriarchy needs to be transcended 
at the same time that traditional roles need to be embraced. And so one questions how in the 21st century our brothers can do that. And one of the things that I would say is that we can do that, whether you're Morehouse man or not, by embracing Morehouse values, integrity, excellence, achievement, commitment to social and economic justice, appearance. Back in the day, and I wasn't there, but back in the day, why well, was there back, but not back back? Um, but you could tell a brother by the fact that he was dressed, that he had a tie on, that he looked, well, he could have been a janitor. He could have been anybody else. But on Sunday when he went to church, you said, this brother has stepped up. The eagle flies on Friday in many of our communities. That's when people get paid. Well, back when I lived in San Francisco, Fillmore Avenue was the main street for us. And if you were walking down Fillmore Street in the 1960s on a Saturday, you would, uh, the brothers would just have their fashion show. They had been to get that suit out of layaway on Friday, and they were ready to rock and roll on Saturday. That's what a black man looks like. That's what a brother looks like. And I think it's really important for you Morehouse men, especially you're our leaders, to achieve that. You know, you can come to Morehouse, you can graduate from Morehouse, you can connect Morehouse, but you're not a Morehouse man. You just went to Morehouse, unless you embrace Morehouse values. Now, I'm not fussing at y'all, because I say the same thing to sisters. I say to my sorors, you're not a Delta woman, unless you look like a Delta woman. I say to the Bells, everybody can go to Bennett, not everybody can be a Bell. And so I say to y'all, as men of Morehouse, be our leaders, look like our leaders. Uh, show us what you aspire to be in 20 years. You know, that's what the whole thing is about. You, if you want to be a college president, start dressing like one. You know, basically visualize who you want to be. You want to be a lawyer, start dressing like one. You know, I told Dr. Franklin, I can usually tell a Morehouse brother, but I met a brother the other day in D.C., and he walked up to me and introduced himself, but he had earrings on that I might have worn. Now, I don't have a big problem with a little diamond in one ear, but brother man was styling and profiling. I wanted to take those earrings off and say, can I have them? That was not a Morehouse man. Now, <laughs> now when I talk about gender roles, I want to be very clear. My brothers, if you transcend patriarchy, you have to understand that women's history is all too often swallowed. And you brothers have to lift it up. We have never had a woman to lead one of our major civil rights organizations. What's up with that? I was in Ruleville, Mississippi, the beginning of this month. One of the proudest moments of my life, and I've had several wild moments, uh, erecting a statue to Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer was the woman who said she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. She was a woman who was beaten to within an inch of her life for simply registering to vote. She had a disability in her eye for the rest of her life for the way she was beaten. But you know, there are only five statues to women in these entire United States of America. Five, some women have two, like Mary McLeod Bethune has two, one at Bethune-Cookman, one in D.C., but only five women have been lifted up in the statuary. This is frightening. It's your job as well as my job to make sure that the patriarchy that exists does not swallow the phenomenal achievements of African American women. Sit down and talk to your mothers and grandmothers about their sir, what they've been through. It's extremely, extremely important. Now I told Dr. Franklin that I multitask. So I was supposed to talk about my life and my career, but I decided I just came by to talk about a couple of other things first. Dr. Franklin said that I, was a grad, I, that I graduated from high school early. Actually, they put me out. You know that I was a high school put out, not a high school dropout. I had the fortunate uh, privilege of being involved in Panther activity. And at some point in time, my mother said, we gonna get you out of here because you will get shot. So I did, as I was sent to Mississippi, where I almost got shot. Just imagine Panther activity, Mississippi. Panther activity, Mississippi. Not a good thing. And I had an aunt who basically beat me daily, but not in a good sense. She said, I will beat you till you have good sense. I'm like, I'll get whipped until I don't. Um, but in any case, she, was, she taught everybody in the fifth grade at Moss Point, Mississippi. 
And uh, they called her the kid breaker because she was just about kill you. But she didn't kill me. I'm blessed to still be here. But, uh, you know, Moss Point, it was a very interesting situation. I always tell people, my mama said, I, it, I was a horrible child. I really was a horrible child. There was a place in San Francisco called Mount St. Joseph where they sent delinquent young people. Usually they sent young women if they were pregnant. But if you were also incorrigible, you could go there. About once a week, I was threatened with Mount St. Joseph. You go into Mount St. Joseph. And I'm like, okay. Um, I said, if you have to go to Mount St. Joseph, you have to be pregnant, give me a couple more weeks and we can work that out. My mother was like, you really do not have good sense. And I didn't. But somehow, I ended up at Boston College. And I'll tell you that story very briefly. I wanted to go to Howard University, but as a high school put out, they admitted me and then every week they would send me a letter saying, send us your high school diploma. But I didn't have one. And every week I write back and say, I don't have one. And they say, we gave you financial aid, send us your high school diploma. And it's back saying, I don't have one. And my mother said, you are going to get there to that HBCU where the rules are rigid and you will be back here in the post office. Because you know what they used to always say about us, you can always find work at the post office. Well, Boston College said they didn't care whether I had a diploma or not. I got there, they admitted me into the early admit program as well as the, um, the honors program. So that wasn't bad. There I was on the speech, um, I was on the speech team, the debate team, and so are our friend, you will be interested to know, you, you had to pick in the box a day that you would do overnight radio on the speech team. So you got to do a radio shift between midnight and 5 a.m. So when I ended up doing that in San Francisco, maybe 20 years later, it's like, okay, this is what I do. But in any case, I picked the same day that my line was going over. So I've got Radio and TV final, line going over. Radio and TV final, line going over. The, the guy, Professor Lawton, he was the meanest man the Lord put on this universe. I went to see him, I said, Dr. Lawton, can I change? No. I said, well, let me tell you, no. And um, the sorors were not particularly understanding either. So what ended up happening is I negotiated that I would do the radio thing from midnight to 3 a.m. My then boyfriend would rush me out to Brandeis, which was about 20 minutes out, and the br brother probably broke a couple speed records, get me out there, and then from 3.30 to 5 a.m., I had to eat everything everybody else had to eat. Now, this was before we had rules about hazing. Uh, I, I mean, so I had to eat a whole lot of stuff, and it wasn't very good, and it was all at one time. Um, I had to walk through the coals right after I ate all that stuff, and, but I got over. I did get over. That was a blessing. I crossed the burning sands. There was one moment where a soror said to me, I'm going to paddle you. I said, oh, yeah? I said, I will paddle you back. You might guess that I have an oppositional personality. Uh, they have now, in psychiatry, come up with something called the oppositional personality disorder. And I said, oh, that would be me. I don't know how they come up with this thing, these things. Uh, Hugh Price of the National Urban League told me once, if you were a child today, they would give you written it. And uh, blessedly, I'm not a child today, but I was one of those kind of children. And I went from Boston College, where I did finish in three years, to MIT, where we had a great time. Reverend, uh, not Reverend, Dr. Andrew Brimmer, who just passed a couple of weeks ago, used to always tell the story about why I was irreverent. We came down to Atlanta. We stayed at Pascal's. We had 50 um, African-American students who were thinking about economics. But of course, we were young people. And so we were also thinking about partying. They had sessions from 9 a.m. to about 6 p.m. And the Atlanta people had told us where we could get our adult beverages and uh, other things. And so I was organizing the party. And so Dr. Brimmer was in the elevator, and you know, he's a very stiff brother. And he said, Miss Malvo, you all might want to focus on your studies. And I leaned back and said, what you mean, Brimmer? You don't party? So he used to tell that story all the time and sort of saying, she's just kind of, kind of out there. But I, again, my career has been all over the place. And I always tell people, I didn't have a career. I had a series of adventures. I went from teaching to doing TV and radio. Um, I went from doing TV and radio in San Francisco to moving to DC to do that. Um, oh, one time I ran for political office. I forgot, about 1984. Of course, you know, I got my hind parts walloped. You know, and I was not a successful political candidate. There was a slight problem. I would say whatever I thought. And you know, you have to do this political thing of sort of walking here and walking there. I wasn't that good at that. 
So we moved along and moved along and have spoken ki all kinds of places, have written all kinds of things, including I used to write poetry. And uh, I was Essence Magazine's first college editor for writing poetry. The poem was called Black Love is a Bittersweetness. And it began one day a real heavy brother told me that love is a 26 letter word. And I go on and talk about that. But so I've been a poet, I've been other stuff. I have had a set of wonderful adventures. Now somewhere along the way, I got the notion that I could be a college president too. And a couple of people, my best friend, one of my best friends, Dr. David Swinton, I used to go to Benedict when he's president and he'd walk through the campus and pick up debris and he, he said, Julie, you can do this. I'm like, David, mm, I don't know. Dr. Janetta Cole, a mentor, said, sister, you could do this. And I said, Dr. Cole, it's getting ready to be an election year. I want to be out there. She said, well, it's now or never. I didn't think they would pick me. I mean, who would pick someone who is acknowledged to be just a little off to be the president of a college? She said, well, you'll never know if they'll pick you unless you apply. I had not written a job application in 20 years. I told Bill Clinton one time, well, just Google me. And so, you know. He said, I'd like to know what you've done. I said, Google me. So I thought I could get away with that. The search firm called. They said, uh, no, you have to actually send us a CV. I said, well, I don't know how. So I hired somebody to write my CV because I just really, didn't really have time to do it. I sent it to them. They said, oh, you made the top 25. I said, OK. Figured, OK, this gives me time to get out of this. Then they called back and said, you made the top six. We want to interview you. So I did a. a a slideshow, which they were impressed with, I told them, I said, I'm going to build some buildings. They either thought I was delusional or that I could do it. They were saying, well, we don't know. But what they said was, we can teach people how to run something. We can't teach people imagination. So I think they picked me for my very vivid imagination. When I got, they got down to the top three, I was like, uh-oh, this may really go down. And then when they picked me, I said, oh, spit. Now I got to work. <laughs> Now, I did say spit, Dr. Franklin. I would not curse in your king chapel. I would not, unless nobody was looking. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, I had an exciting five years at Bennett College for Women, and now I reinvent myself. I tell you this story to say to you that I'm a Renaissance woman, and I want y'all to be Renaissance men. You might major in business. You might major in sociology. You might want to be a doctor. That's not enough. We live in a world that's connected. I want you to be global. Leave this country. When you leave this country, here is what you will find. We are very privileged people. If you go to the African continent, you'll find people living in a room, that's their house, the size of your dorm room. And you'll say, how do they do this? People may not have sanitary facilities. They may go outside to use the restroom, as our ancestor did 150 years ago travel internationally, and not just to the African continent. If you go to Latin America, here's what you'll find. Those folks, a lot of them look just like us because they stopped there. Brazil is majority of African descent, but there's a caste system there that prevents those folks from fully, fully participating. Go to Europe to understand, as Walter Rodney said, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. If you go to the London Museum, you will get mad, or at least I would. Oh, I did. They kind of had to hold me down. All these African artifacts in England, how did they get them? They stole them. They just plain old stole them, put their five finger discount on our stuff and took it. This makes no sense. Go to Russia where Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois traveled and tried to do, Paul Robeson tried to do a movie in Russia. Now he wasn't successful, but go see the world because when you see the world, you begin to see the connections. Now again, I would say I could run my mouth forever, but Fran told me I couldn't. So I'm going to stop. She said, if you run your mouth forever, we will leave while you're talking. I would be so annoyed. But in any case, so I will stop here by simply saying, don't be a man who went to Morehouse. Be a Morehouse man. We need you. We expect you. We respect you. Be the role models for your brothers and sisters. You know, I know that half of those incarcerated are African-American men, but you can model for them. I know that many African-American men suffer from unemployment, but you can model for them. At a time when we had so much, so many challenges, we almost did better than now. Be an entrepreneur if you can't find a job. 
But I'm not going to tell you what Mitt Romney told a student. He said, be an entrepreneur, and if you can't finance your entrepreneurship, ask your parents for the money. Now, with a median income of African Americans of $32,000, your parents are going to say, go with God. I asked my mother. <laughs> One time, my econ club was going to Mexico. So I told my mother, everybody is going to Mexico, and I want to go, too. And I said, I would like to find myself. She sent me $3. She said, this is a train fare for you to go three times to look for a job. She said, you can find yourself employed, but you're not going to find yourself on my dime in Mexico. So you know, be an entrepreneur, but understand your parents don't have the money. Again, let me close with the words of Dr. King, which will remind you of our, your legacy and our challenge as a people. I have the audacity, that means the nerve, to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, peace and freedom for their spirits. Thank you, men of Morehouse, for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Malvo, for your stirring challenge, your wise words, and your moving personal anecdotes. I would like to ask you to return to the podium as we present, as is our custom, but today in view of the special relationship that Morehouse and Bennett enjoy, we present to you this very special token of our appreciation for your words, your wisdom, your series of adventures as they inspire the men of Morehouse to be authentic men of Morehouse. So thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Gentlemen, just very briefly, I do want to acknowledge that there are many uh, friends and guests with us today. One of our speakers, our first Crown Forum speaker, Dr. Gerald Durley, is here. And I'd like to ask other guests who are visiting if you would simply stand and let us show appreciation for your presence. Thank you, Dr. Durley, one of our great public theologians. Gentlemen, also, I want you to know that Dr. Timothy McDonald, the pastor of First Iconium Baptist Church, who you've heard mentioned in the news recently challenging the governor regarding the amendment on next week's ballot. Dr. McDonald is here, and I have to say that together, Dr. Gerald Durley and Dr. Timothy McDonald have been those disciples of Martin Luther King who have spoken truth to power. So thank you, Reverend Tim McDonald, Dr. Gerald Durley. Gentlemen, I also want to uh, acknowledge those who are touched by Hurricane Sandy and to acknowledge, and let me just ask, are there men here whose families and households and neighborhoods have been impacted? I know many of you, I see hands, scores of hands are up all over throughout the East Coast. Know that the Morehouse community lifts you and your families and your neighborhoods and your cities in our prayers and in our thoughts. Many of us have talked about things that we might do, and I hope that you will communicate those to Dr. Bynum and the Department of Student Services so that if we can be of assistance to you personally or to your family, let us know that. We will do all that we can, but all of us can remember, can pray, and can make donations to the appropriate charities. I want to thank again Dr. Malvo for her challenging words and urge each of you to hold on to this message about challenging patriarchy. Patriarch, that notion from Greek and, and Latin of the father, Petros, pat father. That men have historically enjoyed privilege as men. But as men of Morehouse, a part of our value proposition is that we challenge injustice and oppression. Whether the privilege given to men or to people on the basis of color, or on the basis of being of their sexual orientation, we challenge injustice and oppression. And that is core to the Morehouse value proposition. I also want to make an observation that homecoming has come and it has gone. Did you all enjoy homecoming? I hope you had a good time. But I remind you that homecoming happens once a year 
And some of the things that occur on and around our campus are often accommodated once a year. But homecoming is gone now. And so we want to remind you of our values and that we will not tolerate behavior contrary to men of Morehouse College. And even in the realm of our social media etiquette, I've heard something disturbing recently, and I simply want to say, as men of Morehouse, never tweet or retweet something that is inappropriate, that is derogatory or disrespectful of women, of homosexuals, or anyone who is different. I think I hear applause from the Morehouse community. That we do not support inappropriate and unethical behavior in that realm. There will be more to be said, but suffice that for now. Homecoming is gone. Let's get back on focus, move forward with our studies. Let us stand now as we prepare to sing the college hymn.